as a young nurse, I used to listen to the elderly say to me, the golden years are for birds. Like this is not turning out to be golden at all. And you don't really actually appreciate your health until it's gone. I'm going to say, you know, skin is skin, but what if you didn't have mobility, right? And so really start appreciating what you do have rather than what's wrong. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 29 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today, we are going to talk a lot about trauma and how that can impact or even be a trigger sitting or hiding in your system that can then cause issues later on in life and show up as skin disorders, various skin diseases, and even autoimmunity and other conditions that we experience in the body. And there is, by the way, scientific proof. So if you think I'm going to go all woo-woo on you, unfortunately, that is not the case. But first, I want to talk a little bit about keratosis pilaris. I know in the previous episode, we discussed why keratosis pilaris is connected to vitamin A and what that ultimately means, not just for your skin, but for other body systems. However, we've got a question that builds upon the previous one. So I thought that it was really appropriate and helpful to air that question today so that I can answer it. Hi, Jennifer. I love your show. I've listened to every episode but there's a skin condition that you have not yet mentioned yet. I have keratosis pilaris on the back of my arms, thighs, and some on my back. I take cod liver oil every day. I don't eat gluten and dairy. I've taken all my food sensitivities out. I also dry brush and moisturize with AHA lotion. I hear KP is caused by a vitamin A deficiency, and so supplementing with cod liver oil should work. However, I haven't seen changes in the bumps and redness. I've had this condition all my life and I want it to just go away. I hope you can provide some insight on how to get rid of KP. Thank you so much, Angelica, for leaving that question. I love questions like this because while it is connected to what I shared in the last episode, there is something very specific and unique to help you understand how to get the vitamin A into your system that I didn't actually touch on in that podcast. As you hopefully recall, Keratosis pilaris is a skin symptom that indicates that your system is low or deficient in vitamin A. Now, here's the thing about vitamin A. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. So, Angelica, you're really smart in thinking like, hey, I'm going to take this in in the most natural whole food form that I can find, which is through cod liver oil, but we're not seeing any improvement in symptoms. And so from a clinical nutrition perspective, the first thing that we have to think of is number one, how deficient were you or are you now? And that's something we may or may not know because I don't know from your question whether you actually tested for a baseline. Number two, we don't know if the amount that you're taking is enough or sufficient to fill the well back up. And number three, what we don't know is whether you're able to absorb the nutrient from the capsule. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin, meaning that your body requires certain things to happen before it can absorb that fat or those lipids, so to speak. So number one, it has to encounter bile, which is like dish soap, if you want to think of a good analogy. And you also need lipase present. Lipases are fat enzymes or lipid enzymes that help break down these large molecules, so to speak, of fat or lipids into the smallest fragments possible. That way your body is able to absorb them. And the other piece to this is that if digestion and absorption is not an issue of fat-soluble vitamins, then the question is, is there a lot of inflammation throughout the gut? Because an inflammatory state within the digestive system thus causing a state of leaky gut, can also increase the rate by which fats are basically not absorbed and they move further down the digestive system and ultimately create very expensive poop. So my recommendation would be, number one, make sure that you get your vitamin A tested. That way you know where you are and you also know how much you need to supplement by. Just because you take something that has some vitamin A in it It may not be enough if you've got a really significant deficit in place to really do a whole lot. For example, 
with vitamin D, if you if you are vitamin D deficient, like really vitamin D deficient, you're going to have to take 10,000 IUs basically a day for at least a month to try to fill the well back up, assuming that it's absorbed so that you will be in a sufficient state. So realize that like at the 2000 IU capsules, not going to do very much. And so what's in your cod liver oil capsule may just not be enough. It may not be absorbed. So those are two factors that we have to consider. And the one way to understand that is to get the vitamin A level checked. And then number two, consider what's going on in the digestive system and do what you need to, to ensure that any fats that you're pulling into your system are being broken down and thus absorbed. So those would be my two suggestions right off the bat. And of course, if you have any other questions, feel free to send them my way. I love questions like this. And that's why, as always, you're more than welcome. Go over to healthyskinshow.com. If you've got a question you'd love to submit for an upcoming podcast, scroll down. and You'll see where you can submit a question or a voicemail to us to be answered on an upcoming show. With that said, let's dive into today's conversation, connecting the dots between prior trauma in your life and what's going on with your skin. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Today, I have a guest with me who proved me entirely wrong many months ago when I first interviewed her on the topic of how past trauma can affect your health further down the line. And I'll give this story in a moment, but I want to introduce her. She's Dr. Keisha Ewers. She is known as the mystic medicine doctor. She's an integrative medicine expert, doctor of sexology, psychotherapist. Oh my goodness, I cannot say that. Hum- Can you pronounce that for us, Dr. Keisha? Wachimera. <laughs> Wachimera, which is a medicine woman trained in plant medicine from Peru and the founder and medical director of the Academy for Integrative Medicine Health Coach Certification Program. She's in, been in the medical field for over 30 years. And after conducting the HURT study in 2013, and that actually stands for Healing Unresolved Trauma, she developed a model known as the HURT model for understanding how past childhood trauma impacts adult health. And so here's the thing. She's done a lot of stuff. She's got some great books and she's got an event coming up we're going to talk about. But let me give you guys the backstory here. So when I interviewed Dr. Keisha for the Eczema and Psoriasis Awareness Week, she came to me and said, listen, I want to talk about how trauma can affect your health. And I was like, huh? (laughs) Okay. And it sounded really woo woo to me. And I was like, I'm going to prove her wrong. I'm going to pull out all these studies. Yeah, all the studies I found, you guys. So for anybody who's listening to this going, how is past trauma connected to my skin health? Guess what? There are legitimate studies at universities and through physicians and all sorts of stuff that actually show that past trauma, and it can be big traumas and little traumas, can affect your health now that you have not addressed, you have not dealt with. There were publications at major universities like Harvard and Yale and Johns Hopkins. I mean, I was proved totally wrong. So I am very blessed and feel very appreciative that she was willing to come on. She schooled me, which I'm glad about. And she is here to talk about this today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I had no idea any of that was happening <laughs> behind the scenes. It was. I was like, that sound, this is like my skeptic hat. That sounds super woo-woo. Let me really see if that's a thing. And I was like, oh, it is. <laughs> Oops, I was wrong. So I'm glad because a lot of people come to the conversation thinking that that doesn't sound like it would make any sense. And so I just want to share that for anyone listening who feels skeptical There's legitimate research about that. So can you share a little bit about, you know, the issues around trauma? Like, what does it mean to have trauma in your life? Sure. But first, what I'm going to do is do my own little, like, anecdotal proof for myself. (laughs) Please. Eczema and psoriasis used to cover my neck. And I don't have any foundation. on. I don't wear makeup. So I just wear like blush and eyeshadow and that's, you know, but nothing on my face. And so look at that. You know, when I was in my teens, 20s, 30s and early 40s, this was covered. And I used to wear turtlenecks all the time to make sure nobody could see. And so now it's nothing, right? Because I've dealt with my trauma. So (laughs) there you have it. (laughs) 
We're kicking it right off. See, it does We're actually right work. Off. But no. so for somebody, yeah. like, trauma it's... feels like a very vague concept, you know? And so it is. Let's talk about. Yeah, what let's it talk is. about that. So trauma, there are two kinds: capital T trauma and lowercase t trauma. Okay, so capital T trauma would be the kinds of trauma that you think about as trauma. In other words, sexual, emotional, physical, psychological, and even spiritual abuse. Now, lowercase t trauma, this is such an interesting and fascinating study that was done. When I was doing my work around the HERT study, I was doing some brain mapping research. So I was looking at different fMRI studies that have been done on brains that have suffered from PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, which is going to be capital T trauma, as opposed to people that rank high on a perceived stress scale. Now, perceived stress is... I feel so overwhelmed. I'm doing too much. I'm overscheduled. I can't keep up. I can't breathe. I can't do self-care. Guess what? The brain has the same changes for both of those. So if you are listening to Jen and myself right now, and you have been saying you're overstretched, overscheduled, too busy, and you're always feeling that way to the point that you can barely take a breath into your belly, you're just breathing from up here, your body's getting the message that you're like a zebra being chased by a lion and you're about to be dinner. And we're not wired to be in that nervous system state continually, only momentarily if someone's chasing you to steal your purse, you know, or hurt you until you get to safety, you're supposed to be in that fight or flight place. And then you're supposed to resume parasympathetic tone or the rest and digest plays. So trauma is anything that pulls you out of that. That's pretty broad too. It's broad. It's very broad. And we tend to rest into this idea where as humans, we do a lot of comparing with each other, which is very damaging, right? I always say compare and despair. So what'll happen is, is People that have, let's let's use Syria, right? People that have been in Syria and seen their cities bombed and perhaps gone through terrible things like even rape and, and losing family members will have a certain level of trauma that we could say is capital T trauma. And then we have people that are in our country that perhaps, I don't know, grew up with having hand-me-down clothes all the time. I've actually done therapy for a woman whose big trauma in her life was that she never got new clothes. And she had three older sisters, and it was all about, I am not important enough. Her brain would look the same as the person that went through the Syrian stuff. Wow. Isn't that remarkable? It's wherever your bar is set is where your perceived level of trauma is. So if you perceive yourself to be traumatized, you are traumatized. And the brain changes that occur are a shrinkage of your prefrontal cortex, which is the adult executive function brain. It's the one that decides who to date, who to marry, how to spend your time, how to spend your money, what to put on the end of your fork and what to put in your cup. All of those things, right? It's your executive function. And the part of your brain that grows is back in the limbic system. It's that amygdala. The right side of that amygdala grows larger, which is your fight or flight, constantly scanning to see if someone's trying to hurt you. You become hypervigilant. Hypervigilance is another way of saying I'm turned up really high in my fight or flight receptivity. And that, that tends to happen too. Skin issues. I was going to say, yes. because think about it for someone that's constantly checking for a flare and they're always on guard. Am I in a flare? Am I starting a flare? You know, is, are people staring at me? They're experiencing trauma from all, like, I can't even take a shower. If I get in the shower, my skin's going to get really bad. I can't wash my hands. Like it becomes this constant cycle of, of these little traumas throughout the day that, People have even noted that stress can be a major trigger for skin issues. And your perception of your illness is one of them, as you just noted. And then let's take it even further to what we do as healthcare providers sometimes. I wrote about this in my book, um, my cookbook, which is the quick and easy autoimmune paleo cookbook, right? I wrote a big thing in there about orthorexia, the thing that we do where we start becoming afraid of food. We start becoming really judgmental and rigid in our minds around food. So then you're traveling, you're in an airport, and you can't find anything to eat. So you experience as a trauma. And that's only perceived, right? 
it's not actually a trauma. There's plenty of stuff to eat in the airport, but you're right. It's stuff that could potentially exacerbate a flare. So then that's where you have to learn how to have the lifestyle of taking food with you to an airport, right? But in the case that maybe you haven't been able to do it, you very quietly, very gently surrender to the state that you're in right now. It's called radical acceptance, right? And that requires a lot of emotional resilience. So emotional resilience is the thing that actually creates an ability. We call it heart rate variability to be able to come into a state of fight or flight and come right back down into rest or digest rather than hanging out in fight or flight which actually exacerbates autoimmune disease, leaky gut, turns on genetics that we maybe don't want turned on, right? And creates a state of inflammation, which can show up on the skin, but it can also show up in the joints and on your thyroid and in your adrenal glands and, you know, all of it. And so it becomes problematic when we become hypervigilant. One interesting thing as you're talking, I'm reminded of a paper that I read on this when I was doing my research of this woman whose father died suddenly on the operating table when she was 12. And she had eczema, chronic fatigue syndrome, all these really serious issues. And she was doing her research for this article around this topic. So again, a skeptic walking into this scenario of can past traumas actually affect your current day health? And she was like a, a great almost like case study, you know, for this. She realized that this What happened to her father deeply scarred her. And when she started to to deal with it, she began to see a resolution of her symptoms. So that said, for somebody who's listening to this, they may have something in their past. I lived in Manhattan on 9-11. That was a really big trauma. And while fortunately, I didn't know anybody personally that passed away, but it was incredibly scary and gave me nightmares and post-traumatic stress for years afterwards. So then I'm thinking as a listener, oh gosh, do I have to relive all of this stuff, this negative emotion? Do I have to like go back and be in that awfulness in order to find myself more at peace? Like that, that's certainly a concern, a stressful concern. Sure it is. And it's a really good question. And it's one that people have in their minds constantly and it prevents them from getting help. And the answer to that is absolutely not. And preferably, please no. You know, you've already done it once. Please don't go back and go through it over and over and over again. The problem is, is that we do. And so what happens, the hurt model that I developed from my research, which is healing unresolved trauma, I do these deep immersion retreats at my house on San Juan Island. And this is what we do is I teach everyone this model when I go around and and educate people about it. First, what happens is you experience that hurt, right? The first thing. So let's say it's 9-11, which scarred a lot of people, or it's the operating table. You know, someone loses a parent. This is a big trauma, right? And we all have them. And it can be something like, actually, there was a man that I was doing therapy for years ago who had tripped in front of the girl he liked in middle school in the cafeteria, spilled his tray of food all over the place. The entire cafeteria had laughed at him. He had not gone back into a cafeteria. He would skulk in the library during lunchtime for two years after that. So he had created a meaning about himself in that moment. That's a rejection, right? Having the whole cafeteria laugh at you. And most people wouldn't identify that as a trauma, but it was for him. So what you have to understand is you have that moment in time. Now, remember that children do not have a fully developed executive function brain, a prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain is not fully formed until you're 26 years of age. So when you're experiencing all these different events, when you're a kid, you're doing it with an unformed mind. And when children go through these things and they don't have a wise, attuned caregiver right there at that moment to help them navigate it, they will make something up about it. Now, who among us, you know, even I'm a parent of four. I haven't been present 24 seven for my children. It's part of the human experience to have this thing occur. So what will happen is first we have our event and then that will create a a feeling in our bodies. Now let's take this boy who spilled his food in front of everybody. Probably there was shame, right? Intense shame and embarrassment. So he will lodge that feeling in his body somewhere. 
Now, for a lot of us, it's in our gut. For some of us, it's in our chest. For some, it's in our shoulders. For some neck, some jaw. You know, so we'll hold it somewhere. And then we create a meaning about that. So, oh my gosh, I just like embarrassed myself in front of my entire class. And I, I am such an idiot, right? Then a belief will form from that. I shouldn't be in front of people. I'm too clumsy. I'm going to go skulk in the library, right? And then a behavior is used as an adaptation for that belief and that meaning. His behavior was to become very shy, very introverted, and hide out in his life. So whenever he came to see me, why? Because he couldn't get up in his work environment at Microsoft and give speeches. He would start sweating profusely. And he would get that whole social anxiety thing, right? And had this entire sweating problem where all of his shirts were stained because he had all these, you know, horrible sweat spots. And it was embarrassing for him. He couldn't do his job. So when we started working together, the first thing I asked him was, when's the first time you remember having this feeling in your gut that you feel when you get up in front of a group? We had to go back and we had to rewire his brain and reframe that belief that he had, and then change his behavior pattern. This is so important for people that have poor relationships with food or with themselves or in you know codependency with people. You can't actually change that behavior. You have to change the belief and the meaning that informed it. So that's why we feel like we fail all the time in our diet or we are unable to actually change a habit that's not serving us, right? So it, this is such important stuff. You don't have to go back and relive the shame of being embarrassed, but you get to get the power of understanding, oh, that started there. Now we get to rewire that. So it's very empowering. I was going to say it's more empowering. And what I'm also hearing is that, yes, you don't need to relive the actual event, but you're looking at this almost as if you're a third party watching a movie. So there's a lack of that emotional fire that a lot of people- Re-trauma. Can, right, the right? Re-trauma. You're not re-traumatizing yourself. Right, exactly. And you're actually getting to see it from the adult brain. Mm. And you get to say, oh, I see what I did back then. And I see, and I get to actually go and I get to comfort that kid. You know, so what I did is I helped him build a relationship with that 12 year old boy. I had him, you know, reconnect to him instead of projecting him out and getting rid of him because he was too embarrassing, right? We can't fracture parts of ourselves out like that. We become splintered. And then we have these different behavior patterns and disease processes that show up. We have to actually integrate all of this together. So he got to go back and he got to do what needed to happen in that moment, he got a redo, right? And so we took a kind, wise adult part of him back, picked that kid up off the floor, put his arm around him and said, look, buddy, this happens. You know, this is okay. These kids are actually just having, they're having a reflex laugh right now because they themselves fear this very thing. <laughs> you know, nobody likes to trip in front of the crowd. And so what they're doing is they're actually having nervous laughter. They're not laughing at you. And so, you know, you, you are okay. You actually took one for the team, right? We get to do a do over right there. And it's not a reliving of the trauma. It's an actual rebonding with ourselves and pulling that forward because in essence, the fear that you're going to have to relive a trauma is actually happening all the time anyway. Every single time he stood up to have to deliver a presentation, he was reliving his trauma. And so the fear that when you go and you really try and heal this, that you're going to have to relive something, what you don't understand is you've been reliving it over and over and over again. Every time you look in the mirror and you see an eczema outbreak or a psoriasis outbreak, or you're unable to heal any other kind of autoimmune disease. This is what I realized about myself. I had rheumatoid arthritis when I was 30. 23 years ago, I was able to reverse it, but only after I discovered that sexual abuse in, at the age of 10 in my elementary school had something to do with the pain I was in right here, mm. 20 years later, right? And I didn't realize that my perfectionism, my overachieving, my trying to, because remember a 10 year old in a fifth grade classroom 
who is trying to be perfect so she doesn't get called to the principal's office because he's the abuser, right? That's actually happening day in and day out, trying to make sure everyone likes me, trying to make sure. So I became a consummate people pleaser. I was a caregiver. I never made self-care a priority for myself. I was always scanning the environment to make sure I was safe. I was reliving my trauma constantly. RA was just a call to action to stop doing it. It was the gift. And that's a really beautiful perspective that I understand. So anybody listening, I know that that might be hard to hear right now and say, how could this skin issue be a gift? But if you take a step back, because I think that's, Dr. Keisha, that's what you're inviting us to do is to take a step back from the hurt emotional self. I could be wrong, but this is how I'm, I'm hearing it. To take a step back and say, we don't need to keep reliving this. We don't have to keep staying stuck in this space of re-traumatizing ourselves every time we look in the mirror, every time we go out, or every time we go to the gym and we're like, oh gosh, my skin looks bad. Do I have to put makeup on in order to go to the gym? Because people are going to think I look gross. And you go on this crazy roller coaster of emotion. That said, what is one thing, one little thing? I mean, you've got this great event coming up, which I think many of us could could certainly benefit from because there's a lot of information to unpack. There's a lot of trauma that goes along with having chronic skin issues. What's one thing that someone could do when they're done listening to us? What could they do to just dip their toe in the water and get started? So I wrote Solving the Autoimmune Puzzle. And in that book, there are a bunch of worksheets that take you step by step by step through that. So that that's one thing. But to start, the second you stop listening to us is to really start listening to your language. And I don't mean like, shit, damn in hell. I'm actually talking about the way you speak to yourself. How many can'ts, won'ts, shouldn'ts? How many times do you say I'm failing or feel betrayed by your body or by life, by God, by people around you? How many times are, is, is your language wound up with that kind of tone? That actually sets you off into a fight or flight response. And so you are keeping yourself there. And once you start to speak to yourself like you would to the little kid that just tripped in front of all the kids in the school, right? And say, hey, buddy, it's okay. Hey, sweetheart, come on. It's all right. I've got you, right? Right. I love you. I appreciate you. I'm listening to you. You are worthy. You are deserving. Then you're you're actually giving yourself the affirmation and the approval that you're looking for from outside. And the you're never going to get that 100% of the time from the people outside of you. That's not possible. They're too wound up with their own stuff, their own inner dialogue. And so really starting to change your language around what life is doing to you instead of it's doing it for you, and then how you're responding. And make sure that the language that you're speaking to yourself is as if you were a kind, loving parent speaking to a five-year-old child. And that is a big step right there. Don't shit all over yourself, you know? Don't (laughs) do... (laughs) Don't shit all over yourself. There is so much truth to that. Exactly. Exactly. Make sure that you appreciate this beautiful body that is the blessing and gift that you have. Because as a young nurse, I used to listen to the elderly say to me, the golden years are for birds. Like this is not turning out to be golden at all. And you don't really actually appreciate your health until it's gone. I'm going to say, you know, skin is skin, but what if you didn't have mobility? right? And so really start appreciating what you do have rather than what's wrong. And that's part of your languaging. It so is. Well, well there. thank you so much for this conversation. It hits a level of, at least for me, of emotional depth that while I love the science and I love biochemistry and I love looking at gut stuff and liver stuff and all this, I would say to some degree, this is harder work. It's the work that a lot of people don't want to do because it's really uncomfortable. But I love your invitation to everyone listening to start thinking, no, start listening. Start listening to their language of how you experience anything, your day, your body, your skin, your, you know, I love that. And I I challenge every single listener 
to take time and get out a journal and write it down. Like have a a can't, (laughs) write down how many can'ts did I say in a day about yourself? It would be kind of an interesting experiment to see how ingrained that is in your daily life. I'm going to have links to all of that, as well as her website, drkeisha.com, and her books in the show notes. That way, it's super easy for all of you guys to go and check her out, connect with her, and get in the know, because this is this is a root cause. For any of you guys listening and thinking, well, I want to do a root cause approach, This is one of the root causes. And I will tell you, the person who taught me that is Dr. Keisha. So (laughs) thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Keisha. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I know that this interview was a little bit different than a lot of the other things we talk about, but I think it's equally as important and powerful in a sense, because what we do experience in our life can have ramifications further down the road. And it's important for us to recognize that and to know that all of the systems of our body are connected. And it's not just the stressors that we experience in the present moment that can create issues and problems. As always, if you loved this episode, please share this episode with at least one person. If you're in a skin forum or Facebook group dedicated to skin rash problems, please be willing to share this interview with that community. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast over on iTunes if you haven't done so yet. And of course, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Healthy Skin Show, where we'll continue this deep dive into what the heck is going on with your skin and what you can do to rebuild healthier skin. Healthier skin.